So, thank you, everybody. Um, if you want to leave, now's the time to do it, rather than... <laughs> um, Chimamanda's not a hard act to follow, so unfortunately, you've got us exactly. to deal with. It's Chimamanda's um, water here, if anybody <laughs> wants it. <laughs> <laughs> so she's set us a bit of a challenge um, with her questions about what are we going to do? What's the agency that we have in um, the agency that we have in preserving Igbo history? And hopefully, the uh, three presentations that you're going to hear uh, from us are going to help you think about what you might do. Um, so we are three uh, fifths of a group called Transmission. Transmission are a collective of archivists and historians based in London who are all of African descent, working to support and build archives and heritage in and with the African diaspora. Um, we're missing two of our members today who are archivists Hannah Ishmael and Etienne Joseph. And recent projects include uh, being visiting professors at the University of, West Ind of the West Indies on their archives and record management masters. And we've uh, recently submitted a chapter uh, to go into the book Communities, Archives and New Collaborative Practices which is being published by the University of Chicago Press next year, I think. So, to my right, we have uh, Nathan Richards, who is a filmmaker, journalist, and digital historian. He's currently at the Sussex Humanities uh, Lab, where he's a doctoral scholar, researching how uh, digital tools, mediums, and methods are informing African historiography and historic memory and heritage practice. Uh, to my left, we have Ego Ahiwe Sawinski, who's a Minneapolis, <laughs> who's a Minneapolis-based, London-born Nigerian mixed artist, mixed media artist, designer, archivist, and organizer. Uh, her work and research explores the relationship between feminist, queer, decolonializing theories um, and space, uh, curatorial practice, and self-archiving. Uh, practices. And recent projects of hers include the Women of Colour Index at Goldsmiths University, and she's working, or we are working, on developing a collaborative digitisation project to archive the papers of Fela Kuti. Uh, my name is Kelly. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm a public historian, and I also work as a guide in the streets and in the museums and galleries in London, and I specialise in community and especially oral history. Um, and I work, so that's my job, I work online and offline. So my online work is that I'm a volunteer. Um, I am the founding organiser of an initiative called AfroCrowd UK, uh, which is trying to get more people of African descent contributing to Wikipedia. And last year, I was named UK Wikipedian of the Year. So I'll expand... <laughs> Uh, we will expand on all those themes um, as we do our brief uh, talks. Uh, we're going to try to keep to a time of around seven minutes. Let's just start timing it from now. Um, and because this is a round table, this is an opportunity for all, us all to have a conversation. <laughs> so after our brief presentations, we're going to be throwing out questions to you in the audience. And there are a couple of people that I have my eyes on to, to contribute. Um, so but we're going to start off with Nathan. Hello. Um, it's great to be back here. I was here a couple of years ago. Um, uh, I gave a presentation on the Ebo masquerade and uh, digitizing the esoteric. Um, so what's happening to the, um, the spirit of the masquerade as a kind of enters into the digital realm. Uh, but it's nice to be back today, uh, not so much following Chimamanda, which is rather difficult, but to be on the stage with these two, um, it, it's quite an honor for me uh, to be here uh, with them. Um, so I've heard the term uh, archives used uh, quite a lot today, um, and heritage, and memory, and history, and um, I'm at uh, Sussex University and I'm looking at um, digital history and I'm, I'm, I'm generally really interested in the way in which we think about the past, the way we research the past and the, the use of the past. Um, and the way that we use these terms, archive, heritage, history and memory, I think often we assume that these terms um, have a universal and well understood um, meanings and definitions, but they really don't. Um, they don't from culture to culture, they don't from person to person. Um, and so today, really, I just wanted to talk about those two terms, archives 
and history. Um, they have very specific meanings, very specific histories, um, and certainly we've, we've come to use them for, for whatever reason, but um, they're quite specific. Um, so I'm, I'm working alongside Yvonne, uh, or she calls on me sometimes as she's developing the Ebo archive. And um, most of the time when she phones me up and tells me that she has a particular type of problem that she's trying to develop, um, I usually just present more problems uh, to her because that's pretty much what I do best, find problems with archives and find problems with the nature of history. Um, and so I'm going to continue that today, uh, just presenting more problems. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but it will make sense as well. Hopefully, what it will do is um, give a little context for what we do as transmission, um, but also by the time we get to Ego, you'll get an understanding of uh, why, the, why, under, why understanding these terms is, is important. Um, so I want to speak uh, briefly about uh, archives today and history. And I've chosen these two terms uh, because they are frequently used um, and I've heard them a lot today. Um, and so it's really about cultural specificity and cultural context. Um, all of my work um, on heritage and history uh, is informed by cultural context and specificity. What's specific about our cultural and creative practices, how do these creative and cultural practices inform and shape our understanding of the past, of how we preserve the past, how we interrogate it, and make sense of it and use of it. These are the kinds of questions that consume my academic research and what we as a collective discuss on our very active WhatsApp group, um, which I have to mute twice a week, which they don't know about, but... Um, okay. Uh, Sorry. Um, so both Kelly and Ego today will share briefly with you various iterations of uh, the importance of context when in dealing with kind of heritage and history. Um, and these questions of context are important because heritage, archives, history, and memory do not have universal meanings and definitions. They're not impartial. They're embedded with uh, questions of power um, and exclusion and inclusion. Um, and they're dependent upon one's place in the world, both cosmologically and intellectually, as Professor Cobwe was discussing in his, uh, I don't know, did he give a keynote? I'm not sure what it was he gave this morning, uh, this afternoon. It's a keynote. Was it a keynote? Yes. Two keynotes, okay. Um, so by way of an example about the power of archives or the nature of archives. So the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project is a database that runs out of UCL. It's basically a digital record of all of the slave owners that received compensation um, at the end of uh, at the abolition of slavery in 1833. Mm -hmm. um, and in these records, you'll find the name of the slave owner, how much money they got, what plantation they owned. And in the place for the enslaved Africans, there's just simply a number, 2, 13, 14, however many. Um, now, it's not because... Um, well, it's because, primarily because these people weren't important. They were only important in terms of a commodity and a number. Um, but that's not to say that the enslaved Africans were not preserving their past or not negotiating their experience at that time. It's just that the archive is concerned with the written text, the written word. Um, and so the kind of oral traditions and creative practices that the enslaved were... Um, engaging with, oh wow, um, I'm, not even, I'm not even close to the, the, the part yet. Um, those types of practices of preserving the past were not important, so they were not included in the archive. The archive is primarily concerned with the written text. Um, and so, let me just go to a quick history of, of the archives. So, our, archives, I guess, are, are kind of outposts of repositories, and these are kind of ancient. You find them in ancient Egypt, you'll find them in uh, ancient Mali and Ethiopia, and they're just places that would store the records of, of nations. Um, it's not until around about the 15th century that we start, we get the modern inception of the archive, and this comes out of Europe, and it's really about the state activity and documenting the state activity. The people, whether the colonies or here, were excluded from those uh, repositories. Um, 
And um, it wasn't until around about the 1970s, 80s, when Foucault comes out of this idea. He's a, a absurd French theorist. He's, he's great, but he's, he's a little much, a little too much. Um, and he comes out with this idea about how archives are not just institutions or buildings, but they're actually about systems of announceability, about uh, how language creates space for us to see things. So if we don't create a particular language, um, then we can't understand an experience that might be right in front of our faces. Um, and the development of this language um, enables some people to be heard and seen and their experiences and some to be hidden and excluded. So if you don't say it or you don't create a language for it, it's almost like it doesn't exist. This theory moved into the nature of the archives. What's included in the archives um, becomes part of the social memory. What's excluded, we don't find out about. It. Even the inclusions that we have in the archives are, if they're part of a deficit inclusion, so if you're always included as a commodity as a crime statistic, as a, uh, as a colony. You're being included, but you're included in a very particular type of way. Um, and so there are other types, final thought, final thought. And so there are other types of, 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 of archives. What, what Foucault kind of shows us, there's another type of, of archive. And these archives exist um, amongst us all. And so I like to think of Rastas when I see them on the street as archives. They embody a particular knowledge about the black experience that's important. But it's not just Rastas, it's elders in our community, um, it's the people in this room, it's, it's families when they come together and the particular types of ideas come out. These are also archives. Um, how we begin to kind of develop those I think is what's really important for black archive. And we need to move away from these kind of traditional established archives and think about these kind of cultural uh, spaces that we have. Okay, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nathan. Thanks. So I'm gonna do my presentation. I'm over here. So my name is Kelly. Good afternoon. Um, I uh, thank you very much to the organisers, Louisa and Yvonne, first of all, for, for inviting us to speak. I am a Wikipedian, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it's what I do at night, mostly in a leopard print, print fleece dressing gown, I contribute to Wikipedia. Um, as Chimamanda said, it's people who fill in the gaps. And even though we kind of think of Wikipedia as a resource of the internet, something that's always there, um, it's people like me who are contributed to it. One of my main mo motivators, apart from what I feel is righteous procrastination, I feel like I'm doing something <laughs> beneficial to humanity, whilst also kind of putting off other things that I should uh, prioritise. Um, is that I want to fill in the knowledge gaps that are there online. So this is a, 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 a graphic to, um, to uh, visualise the geographically uneven coverage of Wikipedia. So in that red circle, there are more Wikipedia articles inside that red circle, which of course is uh, Europe, than there are outside it. So um, there is this expectation that... Um, if it's online, uh, it, it must be true, it must be verified, verifiable. But Wikipedia um, enhances the biases and the knowledge gaps that are already there in, um, in life. Um, so um, what is Wikipedia? Wikipedia is a not-for-profit uh, organisation. The mission is to imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all human knowledge. Um, it's a not-for-profit encyclopedia, free to use and free to share, that anybody can edit. And it's the top ten, well, it's in the top ten of websites uh, globally. And oftentimes, in that top ten, it's the only not-for-profit website in that top ten. Um, so, sometimes I hear, um, well, I've heard a child say to me before, who discovered the internet? Like it was a resource that was always there. Um, so, this is a... Uh, the Wikipedia article for uh, Chimamanda in Igbo, because there is an Igbo language Wikipedia. There are around 300, almost 300 different language Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully by the end of today, I will convince some of you to be contributing to the Igbo language Wikipedia. Uh, the Igbo language Wikipedia is fairly new. So the English Wikipedia has 5.5 million articles and 135,000 uh, um, regular contributors. Ibo language Wikipedia 
has 1,300 articles and 24 regular contributors. So even if you sign up to contribute to Iba Language Wikipedia today, you'll already be making a, um, an incredible contribution. And what you're doing is that you're creating a, an encyclopedia in Iba language. And for other languages like Welsh, for example, the Welsh language Wikipedia is the largest Welsh the largest website in the Welsh language on the internet. And it's backed by their government because they see the idea of getting the Welsh language online and part of that digital landscape as being very important. Wikipedia is a powerful tool for language preservation as well as for cultural preservation as well. So this is the, oh, the sneak peek. This is a sneak peek of the Ivo Studies Archive. And uh, when I was preparing my presentation, it was the illustrations on there. Um, that inspired me. And I wanted to find out more about these objects. And these are two articles, the article on uh, Ibo people and an article on Ibo culture. I know someone in the room has contributed to the article on Wikipedia, on article on Ibo people, rather. But I couldn't find the answers that I wanted to about the objects that were um, shown on the, on the uh, Ibo archives website. But hopefully that's what the Ibo archive, uh, that... Um, uh, Libo studies are creating will be able to address. Because what Wikipedia relies on, it relies on volunteer labour like mine and hopefully yours and it also relies on citations from reliable sources. And by the establishment of the uh, Ibo archive they are building a reliable source by Ibo people most importantly. So Wikipedia in Africa, those lovely waving people at you are the uh, participants of the 2017 Wiki Indaba. Wiki Indaba is an annual global meeting of Wikipedians. Uh, so that was uh, last year, which was in Accra. And that is this year. This year took place um, in March in Tunis. Um, the, uh, uh, the Wakandan delegation are there on the top, <laughs> on the top left. <laughs> Um, because it was in March, just around the time of the release of Black Panther. And uh, this is Blossom. Blossom is the, uh, at the vanguard of uh, creating articles in uh, Ibo language Wikipedia. She's based in Nigeria. And she runs what's called editathons, workshops, and she especially runs workshops on creating more articles about Ibo women in Ibo language Wikipedia. So that is the team from the uh, Wikimedia user group Nigeria, waving at you. Um, the gentleman there in the uh, collared shirt is the president of uh, Wikimedia group Nigeria. Um, so what's next? How, can, uh, what is, how is the face of knowledge online change, changing? So the Wikipedia article, so the, the, sorry, the um, Ibo archives website will be changing the face of knowledge online about Ibo culture, Ibo people, Ibo language. Um, but also, these uh, lovely people will be greeting us next year because um, the Wiki Indaba goes to Abuja next year and it will be hosted by the uh, Wikimedia User Group Nigeria. And they have also been at the forefront of a campaign to increase awareness about Wikipedia in Nigeria. Um, in a recent survey that was done, only 77, well, rather 77% of Nigerians had not heard of Wikipedia. They may have used it before, oftentimes when we're using Google, we're using Wikipedia without realising it, um, but they hadn't heard of Wikipedia. So the uh, Wikimedia Foundation and the uh, Wikimedia um, uh, Wikimedia User Group Nigeria came up with this uh, advert um, inspired by the novel Things Fall Apart. And if we've got a little bit of time, I just want to play the ad for you to close. So this is... Right, so uh, that is a little bit of an introduction into the possibilities of Wikipedia and what they're doing in the user group in Nigeria. Um, Chimamanda gave us an introduction, uh, gave us the idea of we need to think diasporally as well, because the Ibo community in London and elsewhere around the world can also contribute to Ibo language Wikipedia and in increasing the visibility of Ibo culture, Ibo history, and Ibo people on the, the largest encyclopedia ever created. I'm completely honoured to be with you today. Um, what I'm going to do is take you... Are we ready to do some time travel? It's a long day, yeah? So I'm going to introduce you to my teenage self today. Um, I've taken on the challenge of thinking about what does it mean 
memory, community and culture. How do we preserve our culture? Um, so as an archivist, as an artist, is something that I'm exploring. So today I'm going to experiment, really. Um, and what I'm using is my personal archive. Um, I'm, I'm using photographs. And it's really an ode to my mum, my grandmother, and all the aunties that I grew up with. It's, to have the opportunity to do this has meant that I've had an opportunity to look at myself in a way that I haven't. You know, you look past, um, you look backwards, and you, you see yourself again, maybe sometimes for the first time. So I'm calling this From Edmonton to MABM, Memory, Culture, and Community. And it's maybe a British, I grew up here, I was born here, but it's maybe a British view of Igbo women and how they transported culture here, really. I'm also going to, so it's going to be pictures and it's going to be sound. I don't know why I'm cutting out. It's going to be pictures and sound. The sound that you're going to hear, I'm inviting you into my living room, Yeah. It's from 2006, and it's a recording that I made of um, the Uweri Women's Union, one of my mum's women's groups, um, remembering my grandmother. I found this recording um, on a mini disc. I transferred it to make it an MP3, but I'm so thankful for this recording, mainly because I captured my mother calling my name. When I heard this over again, I hadn't heard it. I tried to find it and wondered if I even had the recording for this, because I was coming here, what was I going to use? When I heard her call my name, I was kind of <laughs> went to look for her, even though she's in Nigeria, um, and I was in America. That kind of memory that we carry within us, I'm interested. So really, I'm wanting to see what you get from what I share with you. So I'm, I'm opening this up as a conversation. I'm hoping that this inspires, and I hope that it makes us think about what we have already amongst us, maybe upstairs in the loft, maybe underneath the bed. We have this stuff. At the end of the, pres um, at the, end of the images are the objects that I still have, some of the things that I kind of kept. I was also the curious child that never got any answers. So what this is, is almost like a testament to who I always was, the archivist that I've always been. The recording is about five minutes long. The actual um, recording is over two and a half hours. I edited it down to five minutes. But the main thing for me is that there's a period of around 35 minutes where the women sing. And they sing maybe about 30 songs in those 30 minutes. I'm curious about the woman that I think is tapping on a supermodel bottle, um, just keeping the beat. So I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, Eh, 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 
used to do our hair in cotton and she used to sew our clothes. supposed to be like on a loop so I'm just gonna click through the last set of photographs where we go into MRBM. This was 1981 and it was the first time that we went to Nigeria. That's me on the left hand side. I still look like at that look. <laughs> I traveled just before my grandmother died in 2005 with my sister back so we're standing where that photograph that I just showed was taken. I'm obsessed with the t-shirts and the printing at funerals. So this is also about um, how we memorialize and do our funerals, you know? It's also the first place I ever saw a pineapple grow. And just, that was amazing to me. That's my aunt, Auntie Veronica and Uncle Charlie. That's my sister that I traveled with. That's my Uncle Charlie and that's my Auntie Veronica. I don't know if you recognize the sort of coal, like I thing, my mum, so it's just something that I always see on my mum's dressing table, but I still have one of them. I believe this tray came from Festac, but I don't know, but I have it. But it's got Canu on the back, sort of, 
right in the corner, you can see. So just how we find out and see things, you know? A bit of Naira, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I want to thank my mum publicly because the idea that she used to let me take portraits of her in this way, and it's in these moments that I would normally ask her and never get any answers about my culture. So for me, there's a kind of irony to be able to use them in this way here. Um, I'm still working what that means to me because this is all, in some ways, happening live. This is a whole journey, you know? Um, what Louisa and Yvonne are doing is igniting stuff within me, you know? It's beyond what I do as a profession. This is personal, and it, it feels like a lifetime coming to be amongst people that care, because I was that curious sibling that just never got any answers. Thank you. Right, thank you so much, Ego, and thank you all of you who have been such a fantastic audience. Timekeeper? We've got 15 minutes of um, a response to that. So... To start, I've got a question, um, and it's, all, it's, it's based on what Chimamanda, the, uh, the challenge that Chimamanda proposed to us. So what can we, in this room right now, do to shape the, uh, the future of Iba knowledge online? So this is a question to some of you. So is somebody, yeah, the microphones are coming. One hand at least is up, two hands are up. Well, we can yeah, start from one place. Okay, so there's no microphones? All right, so, um, yeah, so if you can stand up and just, yes, Project. speak loudly. Uh, you're close, come. Can you come on the stage? Yeah. <laughs> nice one. Okay, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, my name is Chadi Kobe, and I actually run a blog. Some of you might actually know it's called Ukuru. And it, anybody? <laughs> if you don't know about it, it's um, where I put really old pictures and information about um, Igbo culture and history, and even sometimes language and other things as well. So, I'll, one of the things I think to that question. Which was, the, what was the question again? What can we do? <laughs> yeah. Sorry? UKP, U R U. Is that right? UKP, U R U. Yeah, U R U. Yeah, this is the blog. Well, one of the things I think is really missing is whenever we go back home as, you know, for Christmas or whenever we're visiting relatives, one of the things we don't do is, some people do, I, I, I guess um, Ego was saying that she does ask questions, but a lot of people don't actually ask questions. And another thing is, a lot of parents are reluctant to, give to tell, yeah. yeah, to be asked questions and to tell a lot about their history. So like, one of the reasons I actually started Okoro is because there are a lot of things I thought were missing in the sort of like um, story of, myself, I guess, and I just went out looking for anything I could find on the internet and in archives to sort of fill in those gaps. So one of the th main things I think could help with that question would be just taking pictures. Um, a lot of the times when people go back, I, I find that when people take pictures from Nigeria, they take pictures of just people like people they know, they don't take, because you know, in other countries and other cultures, people take pictures of the environment, you take pictures of old buildings, you take pictures of, you know, history. But with us, I feel like there's a, um, a kind of depreciation or we don't really see value in that, um, things that are old. And I guess that's one of the ways we can help. And this is my blog, which I've been finding old pictures from European, it's mainly European photographers, anthropologists, who have been taking the kind of pictures I wish we're taking now, I don't want it to be so that in a hundred years' time, the only sort of, because there are people even now who take pictures of um, culture, who document history, but a lot of that 
that I find are foreigners. I think somebody else actually, I think Chimamanda said that, that a lot of the um, stuff she was finding was by people who were um, discussing Igbo culture now, or people who are looking from the outside inward. What I don't want is maybe 100 years from now, 50 years from now, the only information we'll have from now is from, you know, not from us, not from the people who actually interact with the culture, and who it's not from us. And there's a lot of, and with this um, information, there's a lot missing from the information because it's been taken by people who might not fully understand what is actually going on, which is why, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. No, no, okay. Which is why one of the things I do is I try to add as much information to the pictures as I can. I'll just finish. Yes. Um, so my name's Adeze and I'm here from DC. And just to answer one of the ideas, I think that, um, it, I think it's been repeated here several times that language um, transmits culture. So I think one of the things that um, everyone can do is speak the language. And I didn't grow up speaking Igbo. I had to learn when I was much older, and it's been difficult. <laughs> but at the same time, just being persistent and keep learning, and now I have kids, we only, we don't, we have a no English speaking house. And even my three and a half year old, I have th um, three and a half year old twins, and I said something in English um, two weeks ago, and he said, Mama, I iswoyibo. He said, iswoyibo. And this is a three and a half year old. And people told me, you cannot raise kids in the States speaking Igbo like this. And I just think it's been encouraging even to my circle of friends who have, and many of them are fluent. They've always spoken Igbo, unlike myself, who's not as fluent. So it's been encouraging. I think if more of our generation start speaking the language and take pride in our language and not criticize people when they make a mistake or a laugh, because a lot of people, they are, um, even my, my younger siblings are afraid because, you know, people don't mean to, but they will make fun of you or say, you know, little commentary. So I think just even being in this community of people who are all encouraging one another to speak the language, to share it, and to have a safe space, I think really will help propel. Um. So timekeeper, how much more time do we have for? Uh, eight okay, so we have eight minutes. So let's see if we can squeeze a couple of other statements in. Hello, my name is um, Chidubem. Um, I just wanted to I think just to talk about um, how we can preserve our culture moving into the future, one of the things me and some of my siblings put together was a group called Okru ID, which is um, a group which is important um, for kind of translating Igbo culture in a way that makes sense to young people who were born abroad or young people in the diaspora or even extending outside of our community, Caribbean people and African Americans who have direct links to our culture and translate, translating our, our culture in a way that it makes sense, it's interactive, and it's interesting and fun and kind of cool and fashionable. Because for me, I think, I didn't get to say this to Chimamanda, but for me, what really made it dawn onto me that, no, this, is, this isn't just a problem, this is a crisis. Because for me, when I realized, it's not just people I know, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Igbo people who were born in the UK, who didn't know that there was a civil war until Chimamanda told them. And that's, that's incredible to me. That, for me, that, was in, that is, that is, a, that is um, a symptom of a culture in crisis because that would be, that would be in, that you would never think that could, that would be inconceivable to think of a Jewish person who didn't know about the Holocaust. It, it, it would be inconceivable. So for, for, for me, what me and my siblings came together and said, no, we have to do something because and for me, it's sometimes it's surreal to think I'm, 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 I had to come together and bring together people I know to kind of to, to, to create a platform where young Igbo people who were born in the, in the UK, because I think what the, um, what the sister said, that 
there's a lot of kind of, there's a culture of, of, of ridicule when people, like, oh, what do you know? You, this, you're born in the, in the UK, what do you know? It's like, come on, in, a lot of us are trying to take an active interest in our culture, and a lot of us are trying to, to kind of navigate our culture in a way that makes sense to us because we were born a continent away. So I think for, for me, what we've done is we've put together a platform which is growing and which is really, which is, for me, which has, which has brought in a lot of people who would have never engaged in their culture in, to the degree that they've done. So I think what, we, what we've put together is, for me, is, is an important bridge in terms of bridging together what, what is the reality of today and what we would like to happen in terms of preserving our culture. Because I think one of, one of the conversations I had just before I, got, I came here, like the days of, like, of there being a mass influx or mass immigration of, of Nigerians into the UK, those days are gone. As in, this is it. This is the community that's going to be preserving the culture moving forward. You're not going to have a mass migration of tens of thousands of Nigerians coming into the UK. Those days of the 90s and the 80s, they're finished. So what... So if Igbo culture is going to survive in the UK, it's going to be us, because it's not going to be it. It's not going to be, they're not important Nigerians in here. OKWU, Okru, ID. And Okru is obviously a discussion or conversation. OKWU, ID. OK, so let's try and squeeze one more oh, yes. uh, point in. No, it's two words. O O K W U space I D. And I'm just thinking that maybe the website, if do you know, like links to as we build as a community, and because Louisa and Yvonne, you know, like they're creating a base and a foundation for us to sort of start to feed into. So maybe that's just a way. I'm just thinking myself as you know, as the question's been put out. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ijoma uh, Ogochuku. And uh, I'm in the UK at the moment, uh, but, <laughs> but I was in Nigeria for 25 years at Nsuka, UNN. I just want to make some suggestions. If you want things to get better, one, learn the language, because I learned Igbo as an adult. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> make sure that all your children speak Igbo. And I can tell you that all you heard about confusion of languages is a pure lie because our children at home were just only hearing Igbo and French because I'm French, my husband is Igbo. And after that, they only learned English in nursery. And by now, they are trilingual or quadrilingual without problem. So the more languages, the better. And it's not only the language, because when you learn the language, you learn the culture. Yeah? Like, you, you know, talk about tafufu. It's, m mash, you know, m eating the pain. You, you cannot get that in English or in French or in German. Every language has a different thing. It's very important. Secondly, or thirdly, you read the literature. I have a lot of Igbo literature at home. I'm reading it, I'm translating it, I'm analyzing it. I have a lot of novels in Igbo, yeah, from Ubezie and many other people. You have to read. When I went to Nigeria last and I bought, bought some, they were gathering dust in the shed of the person because he was not able to sell them. Why? Why do you want to read in a foreign language when you cannot even read your own literature? <laughs> huh? And learn more about Igbo culture. I can guarantee my, um, my field of research is Igbo studies. I'm a, I'm a linguist and a researcher. Now, there are many people that are writing rubbish about Igbo culture, saying, I'm Igbo so I know, and then you read the rest and you, it's hair rising. So, Please, I know better. I, it's true. You, are, you have to learn your own culture. And then I give you the last example. That lady is gone, the lady in wheelchair here. She was one of these Biafran babies. She was taken away from Okeja at the age of two during the war. And she was taken by a senior brother uh, at the behest of the parents. She was taken to Libreville. She was having in Gabon, in a refugee camp for kids. She saw many of them die, die in the plains, die on arrival, die in the camp. And she survived. 
she became a very tough person. She's not easy to go with, but she's a very quality person. And she grew up, and because she was having polio, when the war was ended, instead of being returned to Nigeria, she was sent to France. She didn't know her name. People called her Mary. She thought it was her name. She, it was not. It was her twin's name. She didn't know. She didn't know her age. She didn't know her birth, nom, uh, her birth date. And she suffered in France to, from one institution to the other, trying to make her work again. It didn't work. Eventually, she married a Frenchman, the love, a lovely guy that married her. She doesn't know Igbo. She hardly hears English, and that's why she's, she was completely tired, so she had to leave. But you know what she did? She eventually, when she was 13, she discovered her family. She went back to Nigeria. It was like foreign land to her. She couldn't eventually stay. She decided to make her life in France. But she just didn't say, oh, I'm French now. She has created a website that is called neverforgetbiafra.org. Yeah? And that you can find it online. I'm part of the team on it, so I know. And what we are doing is trying to gather testimonies from former Biafran babies and anybody else interested. You can go to that website put your testimony. What we want is, we're not going to be new secessionists or anything like that. It's completely apolitical, religious. It has nothing to do with all this. All we want is a memory. Because like somebody said, I'm the thank person you, that thank is... Thank you very much. So we've got sorry. neverforgetbiafra.org. Yeah, just to so say, we, we, they are, you need to know about the war. There are many Nigerians that don't know. We haven't got that much time. Thank you very much. <laughs> there is going to be another round table this afternoon where it's about the audience contributors. So this isn't the only opportunity today to speak. Now we have someone, unfortunately, who's got the mic. Not unfortunately, but you've got the mic in your hand. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, no, thank you. Um, my name is... So I've uh, got if, two minutes. Yeah, fine. Uh, my name is Lana. I run um, a social enterprise called Rivers Coaching. And we try... Our aim is to dismantle the education system just because we think it doesn't, um, it doesn't support our children. Um, I'm really glad to hear about, you know, us trying to think about educating our children to know more about our histories. In terms of answering the question, the roundtable question, um, Ego, just listening to your discussion and your um, presentation was really empowering and made me realise that we're all archivists. We've been archivists. We've been doing it since we've been small. We're at home. We've got those resources and things at home. And I think in trying to honour that and continue that, it's about not giving, this is what gives whiteness and this is what gives supremacy power because we think we have to be educated. We think we have to be doctors to be archivists. When we've got those resources, we've got those, um, those, those things in our homes that actually document our history. So, you know, we have mobile phones. We should be recording our conversations that we hear our mums and our aunties having. We should be, um, you know, sharing our pictures that we've had from when we were small because those are all part of those resources that tell our history. Mm -hmm. um, and we just need to get out of that mindset of you need to be educated or you need to be in the title of archivist to archive. We're already doing it and we need to continue that. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We are unfortunately going to have to close this roundtable. Remember, there is another opportunity this afternoon because there is another roundtable um, in the programme. Thank you. Uh, really sorry for those of you who didn't get a chance to speak. Thank you so much for being such a great audience. And, yeah, round of applause for us all. Thank you.